So thank you everyone for being here today. Um, if you were here um, previously, you know this call was kind of rescheduled. We had some technical difficulties. Um, we were seeing a little bit of instability with Jupiter earlier today. It seems to be fixed. Um, nurse uh, staff is very good about getting things back up and running as fast as they possibly can. So um, we we don't anticipate there being any problems, um, but just so you know, if suddenly we're seeing something again, uh, we we know because we were seeing something this morning um, and they'll probably already be working on it before we even notice. So um, just in case, um, but we will be using the Nurse Jupiter Hub later today um, in our call to go through the activity together. Um, so yeah, so let me just talk a little bit about getting us going for today. Um, if you've never used the Jupyter Hub or Jupyter Hub in general, um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about what that is and how to use an interactive Jupyter notebook. Um, some logistics um, in general, um, we do like to be able to keep track of who attended just so we can send you any material afterwards or um, any follow up. So if you are in the Zoom session, um, if you could change your name so that it's your first and last name, that helps us um, just keep track of who attended. Um, there is a uh, transcript uh, option, so you should be able to get closed captioning, um, but this session is also being recorded and we get all of our uh, training, uh, actually, I mean, all, all of our meetings, actually, is it all of our meetings? Definitely our training meetings, uh, our training events, um, get professionally captioned and then get re get posted on YouTube. So if you are in a situation where you're wanting to go back and watch something and you didn't quite catch what was said, you can wait, um, usually takes a couple of weeks, but then we get the captioned version, uh, posted on YouTube. Um, and that's done by like people, not by AI. <laughs> Um, just make sure you're muted. If you have a question, the best place to put it is in the Google Doc, because then that way everyone can see the response. Um, but there will be times when you are welcome to unmute and ask your question. Um, and then we will have a survey. The surveys are really important to us. So please make sure you fill out the survey um, near the end of today's session. Um, okay, so uh, we've given you all of the uh, materials. You've been getting those links in the chat just now. Usually you can always go to our training website on the nurse.gov website and find all the materials. You can find materials from tons of previous trainings. Um, we even had a really detailed CUDA training. It was 13 parts um, and all of that material is also there. So if you go into the training materials, we try to have it kind of archived and there's different years, um, but you can um, look around there and see all of the previous material and anything you might wanna um, learn about. And I think we might be um, having that training again in the fall, is that correct, Helen? Um, you mean that 13 part? Mm -hmm. That has not been... Um scheduled or planned. Okay. There's a lot of good material, so feel free to re refer back to um, the previous uh, materials and videos. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so for today's hands-on exercises, um, the the way we recommend doing it is um, SS, you can SSH into Perlmutter and um, you, I mean, you can put it anywhere you want. We kind of recommend put, going ahead and putting it in your scratch directory, um, you know, so CD into your scratch directory, and then you can use Git clone to clone uh, the GitHub repository into um, your scratch. And that way um, you can just run all of the exercises right there. Um, and in general, we have our docs uh, pages. They have um, lots of information on how to run jobs and how to do interactive jobs. Um, today, you may or may not need to actually submit like an SBatch job or even use SALUC because um, we'll probably just be doing stuff in the notebook. But if you want to, um, you can you can do those things. And if you need to look up how to do that, you can use our documentation. Um, <sighs> If you, uh, we do have a reservation today. Um, you have to be part of the NTRAIN 3 project in order to use the reservation. Um, if you 
need to get access to that, you can put that in the chat and I think Helen might be able to add you, but it does take a little bit of time, which is why we uh, tried to have this all done by people registering ahead of time. If you register today, um, it's still possible that you won't be able to get access to the reservation. That doesn't mean that you won't be able to do the um, the exercises. Um, you know, I I was able to get a shared GPU node. I didn't use the reservation, um, and you know, there are GPUs available. The reservation just makes it a little bit faster. They're reserved for people in the project. Um, so if you if you registered today. Um, you may not be in that Entrain 3 project yet, which means you may not be able to access the reservation. But if you registered in advance, um, especially before the previous time we tried to run this, then you should definitely be in that Entrain 3 project, which means you have access to the reservation, uh, which is until 4.30 p.m. today. So if you're running something uh, today, you're using that notebook and you want to do something bigger and try something, you can use the reservation today to do that. Um, and yeah, okay. Um, okay, so in general, um, you know, it's just important to us when we do these training events that everybody remembers that we have a code of conduct and we're just going to uh, respect that code of conduct. We're going to um, be uh, respectful towards each other and work towards helping everybody learn the material. So if you're new here, if you're an expert, um, you know, everybody is welcome and everybody's able to participate um, we, we do have everybody sign this code of conduct. So if you, um, I actually, I'm not sure how it works for training accounts, but if you have a NERSC account, you have signed this code of conduct and you've agreed to, um, uh, respect it. Um, if you ever come up on any issues during a training event, um, during a community call, anything like that, um, you can report it to us and we will go through the process of, of, uh, handling that. Um, we haven't had any issues. We just want to make sure that we are prepared in case there was any issues because we just want everyone to have a really good experience at our events. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about Python and GPUs and um, Jupyter on Perlmutter. So um, there are a lot of different libraries um, that you can use in order to actually utilize GPUs um, when you're running your Python. So um, a lot of the ones you're probably used to, NumPy, SciPy, they do not utilize GPUs out of the box. So um, they're not set up to run on GPU, they'll run on your CPU. Um, so in order to um, get your Python code to actually use the CPU, you're going to have to use um, some different libraries. And uh, we've listed a bunch here. You're probably familiar with a lot of them. So there's the sort of drop-in replacements, uh, which is QPy and Rapids. Those will um, replace NumPy, SciPy, Pandas, and Scikit-learn very easily. Um, some of these, and I, I haven't done this recently, but some of these might have started adding some GPU support, some of the um, the basic uh, libraries. Um, you, again, some of you may know better than me, um, but if you aren't familiar with those, you can always uh, try using these other um, libraries instead. Um, a lot of the machine learning libraries now do support GPU. They'll have like a, a way to, you know, identify any uh, GPUs and then you can tell them, you know, to, to train on those GPUs. Um, so all of the, you know, the two major ones and then JAX is another one that people use now. Um, those, those have GPU support. Um, if you want to write your own GPU kernels, this is where you're going to start using uh, Numba and CUDA Python. Um, so actually today, and I think the activities today are mostly focused on Numba and that will let you actually write your own GPU kernel. Um, but it's possible that a lot of the stuff you want to do, um, those GPU uh, functions already exist and maybe you don't need to, but today you'll learn about how to do that. Um, and then there are ways to parallelize over multiple GPUs. So if you're familiar with MPI, there's MPI for Pi and, uh, and then there's MPI for Pi plus X. Um, there's also Dask. Um, I've used Dask for multi-node, uh, um, but CPU parallelization, but I guess they also do GPU, which is pretty cool. Um, and then there's CU numeric um, as well. Um, I'm not totally sure if we're going to talk about those, but just in case you wanted to know what those are, now you have those uh, library names, you can Google them and find the documentation. Um, 
So yeah, there's um, a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of GPU or there's a lot of libraries that are trying to provide GPU support. Um, and there's ways that they've done this by kind of standardizing and making it so that certain arrays look the same, array-like objects look the same so that they can be um, stored in GPU memory, you know, just regardless of what kind of library you're using. Um, so there's a lot of efforts to do this uh, because GPUs are very popular and useful. So um, the way to use um, CUDA, uh, you know, some of these CUDA libraries on our system, there's there's actually two ways to do this. Um, so one is through using Conda, and when you do the module load Conda um, command on our system, it will default load um, the CUDA toolkit in the default version. Um, so uh, then you can go ahead and make your um, uh, Conda environment, and then you can pip install whichever, you know, if you're doing Kupai, you'll tell it which version of Kupai you want to um, install, and it will be able to handle uh, that compatibility. Um, you might have to decide the version uh, based on what version of the toolkit you're using. Um, but if you want to do something more specific, you want to do use a certain version, or you want to handle that yourself, you can actually um, do something similar, unload the CUDA toolkit, and then use um, Conda Forge, and it will actually handle the CUDA toolkit dependencies um, for you. Um, so it kind of depends on how much you want to be sort of uh, managing the different um, versions. Um, so yeah, so those are two different ways to do that. OK, um, so. So I've talked a little bit about Jupyter. Um, we're going to be using the Jupyter um, hub that NERSC provides um, in order to run. Well, you you can run, you can do whatever you want. You can you can run it on your system in whatever way you want. Um, but the the GitHub um, uh, link that we sent you has what's called a Jupyter notebook. Um, and so this is kind of an interactive environment where you can run code, um, you can do live coding, it can, you can have uh, text in there, there's markdown, all kinds of things. And it kind of makes for like a a guided um, coding experience. And Jupyter Hub or Jupyter Lab is um, the interface that can handle not only these notebooks, um, but also other kinds of uh, applications. It has a terminal. Um, you can uh, do just like text editing. Um, your notebooks can be different types of notebooks. Um, if you look in our Jupyter Hub, and I haven't used everything in there, there's a bunch of different things that you can do. Um, so you can use, you can just use like a Python notebook. There, I think there are like R notebooks. There's, there's all kinds of different things. Um, and the way you access it is by going to jupyter.nurse.gov. So I think, um, yeah. So um, if you haven't done this before, um, just go to jupyter.nurse.gov in your favorite browser. Um, I use Chrome. I think you can use any browser you want. Um, you'll see a big orange button and you'll need to sign in and you'll need to authenticate. Um, this will require your MFA. So if you... Um, actually, I guess I don't know how Jupyter Access works if you have a training account, because usually training accounts don't have MFA set up. Um, Helen, maybe you can comment on that. Um, but if you have a NERSC account, you can use the Jupyter Hub. They, they okay, should so, be able to use Jupyter Hub uh, without MFA okay. as a training account. Okay, okay so just, it just won't. It just won't leave it blank for MFA. Oh, I see. Okay, good. So yeah, so if you have a training account, you can still use it. And then, so you will be asked MFA, you just like leave it and press enter. Is that what you do? Or it won't ask you? Yeah. Which one was it? Uh, no MFA needed. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Um, okay. And then the next thing you'll do is you'll need to choose which type of uh, basically instance on Perlmutter you want to run. Um, so this is basically like asking for an interactive job using S Alec, but you're telling it specifically, you want it to ma make that job, you know, ask it to, to submit that job, get a, a interactive allocation, and then, um, use it to run your Jupyter notebook. Um, and so there's different, um, options here um, if you do. And the nice thing is they explain pretty much right there what they do. So you don't have to um, 
you know, try to decipher what any of them are. Um, for example, today, I just went ahead and used uh, a shared GPU node um, to get one GPU on a node. Um, but you can, if you want, use the configurable job. And that way you can ask for, um, a sh a sh I would suggest using a shared node as well. So one node, one GPU, but then you can put the name of the reservation in there. And I think the name of the reservation was August underscore Nug. Um, but I think it's also in that Q&A doc. So if you want, if you're, if for some reason you're having trouble getting just a regular node or, you know, you really want to try using the reservation, you can do it with that con configurable job. And then you will see your Jupyter Hub. Um, uh, so let's see here. Oh, okay. So this is the um, kind of, this is what I just explained. Yeah. So um, it'll, it'll, uh, make a make a job for you based on whatever you whichever one of these buttons you press um yeah so the configurable job you go and you press start and it'll take you to this uh options page um you will put in uh all, all of these you know so put in your account um the constraint would be gpu um leave the qos as jupiter um, basically, I think there should be defaults in here. I would say basically leave everything exactly the way it is and then just change the name of the reservation to use our reservation. Um, and then you can press start and hopefully the time it takes to actually spin up the server will be pretty quick if you're using the reservation. And I went ahead and put a few directives into the chat. So if everyone could please uh, go ahead and log in to Jupyter and um, do the uh, configurable server option and we're going to dive straight into um our activities and our first part of our meet call today is going to be fully in jupiter and then we'll come back to some slides for a little bit of follow-up but let's give everyone about three minutes to try to get situated and up and running and um you will also want to go ahead and uh clone the uh the repository and we will jump right into using our Jupyter Hub notebook. Awesome. So I okay. will so I'll let you drive. Right yeah, thank you. And I will just give it about three or so minutes or I don't know, maybe five to get people. Let's yeah, let's take about five minutes to allow for people to get um situated. And then what we're going to do, we'll be working in this notebook um, for about halfway through, well, halfway through this notebook, and then we'll be following back up with um, talking about uh, Kupai and a couple of other libraries. So let's give it about, it's 2.23, let's say, um, or 11.23, so let's say by 11.27, and then we will get started. And if you have any questions, um, we will be right here. Please enter in the chat or speak up. And Helen has entered a note. If your training account has expired, you can apply for a new one and use the code BQ73. I will just wait about two more minutes and we'll do a call to see if anyone still needs a little bit more time to make sure we allow for everyone to get comfortable. That would be a good time for a little elevator music, but. Anyone have a calming singing voice? There is a glitch that, that uh, existing users do not appear to be in this account. So for now, I think about at most one hour, everybody should have access. But for now, you could, could try to just do go into a shared GPU node. If you're a NERSC user, uh, use your default um, project, please. Uh, unfortunately, for, for the uh, um, users uh, that needing a uh, training account, if you are applying for still now, starting to apply, it still also take up most 
uh, one hour. But let's check. It could be faster. So maybe, um, Charles, you can go ahead and just talk while people okay. um, either wait for the entrance fee to kick in, or if you have an existing nodes project, use your own project and choose share GPU nodes on JupyterHub. Okay. All right. Well, we will go ahead and uh, get started with that. Uh, so someone was asking in the, Helen, would you be able to answer the chat? Yes, I would uh, do. Okay. Thank you. All right, everyone. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, as Lippy mentioned uh, at the beginning of our call, we have both uh, joined uh, NVIDIA's um, Instructor Academy and their Deep Learning Institute um, to become uh, certified NVIDIA instructors. And so throughout the next few months, we'll be doing a number of calls uh, aimed at um, informing our users about how to use CUDA and CUDA with uh, various uh, aspects of Perlmuter. And so for today, we're going to focus on introduction to CUDA with Python with Numba. And so who all here is, has used uh, CUDA Python before? Do we have any uh, semi-experienced users present? And if you do, you can raise your hand. Awesome, we have a couple of people, five or six people have raised their hands. Okay, good, good. So this is a part of a, a larger um, training course that focuses on uh, introducing CUDA Python with Numba, um, custom CUDA kernels in Python with Numba, and multidimensional grids and shared memory. First, we'll start off with part one training module, and we're going to introduce CUDA Python with Numba. And it's going to be a little bit of background into Python because um, we might have a few users that are not as familiar with Python and Numba. So um, if you are an advanced uh, Python user, uh, initially it might be a little bit, um, a little bit of pre-work for you to understand, but that is quite okay. So just bear with us a little bit, okay? So in this module, we're going to focus on using Numba to compile uh, functions on the on a CPU and GPU, and understand the inner workings of Numba and how it is used to for CUDA and GPU acceleration. So we will start right there. Um, our objectives that we are going to focus on and learn about is how we use Numba to compile Python functions for CPU. We're going to understand how Numba compiles Python functions, how we can use GPUs to accelerate NumPy ufuncs and accelerated um, vectorized functions and understanding a little bit of data transfer between CPU and GPU. We will probably um, stop with our workbook and at the NumPy ufuncs and pick up later with the other components because we'll also focus a little bit on um, CuPy as well. Okay, um, is anyone having any problems or anything uh, getting access to the repository or being able to download the notebook and, and or access Jupyter? All right, well, if not, we will continue on. Um, I will just be in and off camera because sometimes it's a little bit distracting for me, so, but, um, I will just, I'll come in when I have the questions so we can engage and discuss as well, if that is okay with everyone. So, right. So what exactly um, is Numba and how do we use it um, with Python? So we want to keep in mind that we can use Numba for, on Perlmuter to allow for Python functions to be converted efficiently from machine code into um code that can run onto our CPUs and GPUs. So this is important for our um, environment, our research environment at NURSE and the computational resources that we have to utilize as well. So there are a number of different um, components that we can use in Numba. And so we have our just-in-time 
uh, time specialized specializing and function compilers that are can can be used in order to numerically um, numerically uh, focus accelerate numerically focused Python for our science um, applications, whether it's on a CPU or a GPU. And so we have a little bit of a little front matter. This is just in general. You're on Perlmutter, so really uh, the requirements will be met as well. So we don't need to worry about that. But this is just in case you wanted to install it on your own system or whatnot, so that you are aware of those requirements and what are in place. Do we have any questions about uh, any of these components? Okay, well, first let's talk a little bit about um, some of the, the breakdown of some of our specialized uh, functions for Numba. So we have our function compiler and who here has, before we get started, who here has not used Numba before or is a, a Python novice? We have a few people. Don't be afraid to to raise your hand. It's a bird's eye view once you learn. So, okay, awesome. We have a few people that aren't um, familiar with it. Okay, so what we want to keep in mind is is that with um, Numba and these uh, specialized uh, focus Python functions, we can have our function compiler, and this is used to com Numba compiles our Python functions and um, not the entire application, but parts of it. And so this doesn't mean that Numba is going to replace uh, Python's interpreter. It's just another Python module that we can use. And so we also have for type specialization, specializing. That allows for us to be able to speed up certain functions and you know apply for specific specialized implementations for different data types that we're using. And then we also have um, the ability to do just-in-time um, processing or just-in-time, which is a, a way that Numba can translate our functions uh, when they are called. And so this is what we can use, use by the compiler so that we know what argument types we'll be using. And this allows for Numba to be used uh, inter interactively in our Jupyter Notebook like we're using now. And so number is also what you want to keep in mind is that it's uh, numerically focused on specific data types, such as uh, int, float, and complex. And so it's uh, limited stream processing support, and there are use cases. Um, there, are there are many stream use cases that are not going to work on, on a GPU. So you get to get the best results with number, you want to likely use NumPy arrays, as Lippy alluded to earlier. Okay. Now, so let's kind of do a little breakdown and comparison of some things that are available for us to use. So Numba is not the only way to program with CUDA. Um, there are other ways in which we can do CUDA. Our first uh, bird's eye view was again, focused on CUDA with C, C++. And again, that's the most, uh, that's considered to be the most common performant and flexible way to utilize CUDA and it can be used to accelerate um, our applications. Uh, any thoughts on, on why maybe uh, CUDA C++ is the most prompt, most common and uh, most utilized way for um, accelerating uh, scientific applications? Does anyone have any thoughts or? experience using CUDA with C, C++? And if you do, maybe you could share your experiences and why. A lot of times it can be related to the type of applications that you're using. Um, if you're going to use something that's a little bit more uh, intensive and performance limited, uh, you want to make sure that you're using uh, a programming language that is going to be close to machine code. So any thoughts or any um, experiences on using CUDA C++? C++? And if you do, how about entering that into the chat? Um, another way um, that we can accelerate our code is using PyCUDA. Um, PyCUDA is a little, 
a lot less popular and it can be used to expose um, the entire CUDA C, C++ API. Um, it can be used performant for a CUDA option available for Python, but it requires writing C code in your Python. So it's a lot of code modifications. So that's the reason why it's a little bit less popular. And so we also have our ability to use Numba. So we have a problem here from Kevin. Helen, would you be able to help Kevin with his problem or? Yeah, I'm looking at him. He needs to apply for a training account. I just put that. Oh, no, you're no problem, yeah. Kevin. Thank you. Okay. All right. And then continuing on, we also have um, what we will be focusing on is Numba. And so Numba is a little potentially less performant than some of the other options like PyCuda, um, but it doesn't expose the entire, entire CUDA C, C++ API. So it is allow, it still allows for us to be able to uh, provide massive acceleration with little code modification. And it also makes things more convenient for writing code directly in Python. So that allows for us to be able to optimize the Python code for a CPU or GPU. Okay. All right, so let's continue on with our First steps. Again, this is a little bit of front matter for uh, some of you, maybe, but uh, please bear with us for some of our users that are kind of new to Python. Okay, so what can we do to compile um, for our CPU? So you want to keep in mind that um, we can use our we can use Numba to optimize our code on the CPU and uh, our GPU, and this allows for us to provide for acceleration. But what we want to keep in mind is that the, the Numba compiler um, is used for enabling a, a function decorator for to a Python function. And so what that means is that these are decorators or function modifiers that we can use to transform the Python functions. And so they transform it in a sense that we can, um, you know, embellish it and provide it with a little bit more um, uh, it provides for uh, ability to make it the syntax a little bit more simpler. And so in order for us to do that, or the decorator that we use is um, the at JIT for just in time. And so some first steps that we have here, accelerating. So let's take a look at this code segment that we have here. And I'll allow for everyone to just take a quick look at it and see what's going on. And so we see first thing first at the top that we are going to have our import statements. And so we have from number from number imports uh, JIT, and then we also have import math. And so again, we want to keep in mind that JIT is just a, a decorator and it's provided by number and we can use that to compile our Python applications. We also import the math model module, and that module is what we use for our mathematical operations. And so we have our declaration of um, at JIT. And so we also have here a no Python equals true declaration as well. And then what we have is we have our function that is defined. And so this is going to be a, a function that is going to be used to implement a hypotenuse function with number. And so the implementation details are available here for those curious. And so what we have here is going on. The key part of this is that the decorator function is also telling us that we want to optimize it for machine code. And so we have no Python equals true. And that's going to tell number that in this mode, we want to compile the function entirely into machine code. So if it encounters any Python features that it cannot compile, it will raise an error. And so in many ways that can ensure that um, it can ensure that your function runs as efficiently as possible without any feedback to the Python interpreter. 
So if everyone can just take a moment to execute. And so we can execute our code here as we step through. And so with our hypotenuse function, it gets called. And what we're passing in is our parameters. And this gets optimized. So the hypotenuse function returns a value of five, and that is respected. That, that's expected. That means that the function is performing as we, we thought it would. And so we can go into a little bit more detail about when hypot is called, but we just need to know that for the this first time, we can call hypot and the compiler is triggered and compiles the machine code implementation for the function. So we have a question or a raised hand from Sam. Yeah, so um, just to clarify, so you started this as a shared job on a GPU node, so it is compiling and running for the, G the GPU. Mm -hmm. And it takes care of transparently of moving things to GPU memory or unified memory and back. At a high level, a little bit later, we'll talk in detail about, well, actually not on this call, but a little bit later, and even in this, and even in this uh, module, we go a little bit into more detail into making use of uh, memory within CUDA, but that will be in more detail and more explicitly on our next call. Okay, but right now the Python interpreter itself is running in a CPU process on that GPU node, but anything compiled with Numba would be executed on the GPU. Um, that is, it could if you specify depending on how you specify it. Yes, this can run on a CPU or a GPU. Okay, all right, thank you. No problem. And that's another point. We can accelerate our code to either run on a CPU, um, or our, we can accelerate our parts of our code that will run on the GPU and keep the CPU portion intact. And that's how we want to uh, improve our performance. Good question, Sam. Do we have any other questions? Is everyone in the work, everyone able to download the um, work, the um, Jupyter Notebook perfectly fine and get launched up and going? I know we had a few difficulties first starting off. All right, good. I so think will... most users are probably our existing users are added to um, entrance re. I mean, this has kicked in. So you could try configurable configurable GPU jobs and choose shared QoS. Uh, I've put that into the chat and uh, dash C32 CPU cores in one GPU node. Then putting the reservation, it should work. Awesome. awesome. For non-users, if you just apply, depending on when did you, you know, send in the new uh, training account request or apply for that via the four-letter code, it may kick in at different times. But it's pretty quick, it seems like. Okay. All right. Share GPU. So some people are actually using the logging node. That's also can be an alternative because um, the accessing on logging node is immediate once you're added to the the IRS um, from, from our database. It the logging and having access to logging nodes um, are immediate. Having access to the GPU compute nodes takes some more time. So yeah. So to in order to you know uh, follow along uh, with the Jupyter Hub notebooks. Um, Using choosing logging node is an alternative for now as well, or um, shared GPU nodes if you are an existing user. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Helen. Okay, and we will continue on. All right, so now let's also kind of take a look and see what happens um, with the um, hypotenuse function if we call it. Um, the compiler is going to trigger and compile the, the machine code implementation of the function for a floating input. Uh, Number also is able to provide for an, its own original Python implementation of, of the function pyfunc attribute. So we can use that call 
in order to make sure we get the same answer. And so this is good for us to be able to make sure that we're able to compare some different outputs. And so with that, we do see the same thing. And one way that this is useful for is it's good for uh, debugging, um, testing out um, a different version or implementation for just dismiss for that um, as well. And that allows for us to be able to provide for debugging of different scenarios for different, a compiled, ver compiled version of um, a function um, versus a uh, Python ver ver versus another version. Okay, so how exactly um, is this important for us to understand? So next up, we're gonna focus our attention on understanding how we can use benchmarking um, just at a brief, very high level, okay? So one thing that we wanna consider about um, benchmarking is it allows for us to provide mechanisms for seeing how we can optimize our code. And so what that means is we just wanna measure the performance and see if there are any differences in how we have been able to optimize it. And so we can do an original version or implementation comparison of our, hypot our hypotenuse function with the number compiled version that we have here. And then we can also do it um, against our, uh, against our, uh, or Jupyter or a Python version. And so with in Jupyter Notebook, we can use the, the time it um, magic function to, to benchmark our code. And so it's just simply um, using time it here. And then we have our hypotenuse.py func function as well that pass into our, passes in our floating point variables that we can use. And so if we want to just execute this, we can execute it. Sorry. And let's give it a little time. Uh -huh. Okay, so this is showing that it was able to execute in 374 uh, nanoseconds. Um, I'll let everyone take a few seconds for everyone else to execute it. Okay, and you want to keep in mind that the, the time it magic runs the, the statement many times, so it's able to get an accurate estimate of how it is being ran of, of the runtime. And so it will return the best time by default. And so in many cases, this is going to be used in order to try to reduce the, the prob probability that, you know, random background events affect your measurements. So you know, if a node outage occurs or something crazy happens that you are effect efficiently, um, effectively getting a accurate measurement. Okay. And so now what we want to do is also we can compare the, the, the runtime of the original time it function and see how much speed up we have. Okay, all right, and so what we have here is we see that this function executes in 155 seconds, nanoseconds, uh, plus, plus or minus 5.6 nanoseconds. So if we were to see what our speed up was looking like, we would take 374 and we want to divide it by 55. And maybe people want to try that little calculation theirself on their phone or in their head or, but it's going to give you like a 2.4 speed up. So that means that we have Numba did a, a pretty good job with this function and it's going to run faster than in the pure Python version. So we can also um, test it using um, the math function as well. And so with that, It's going to be a little bit faster. Okay. 
So that executed in 93.6 seconds. And so even that means even Python's built-in um, hypotenuse function is faster than number. And so that can occur again when you have uh, different implementations. Um, sometimes a, a function will introduce just a little bit of overhead that can throw things off. And so with functions like these that are extremely fast, that can kind of add up. Okay, so we'll let about two minutes for people to just kind of step through and work through this before we move on to this next exercise right here. So let's say until about 255, we'll let people just kind of toy around and work through it a little bit until about 1155. Question from number function with another takes care of recompiling and re-inlining a dependent function if one of the dependencies is redefined. So it'll it'll um so number is gonna compile it uh the first time it's called and if you call um Another number function is going to compile it um, each one independently when they are first uh, in full. Well, you, because you say like it can, inline, it can inline a dependent function or a child function or something. So if you change the child function, it it would need to recompile the parent function that depends on it, right? Or do you have to? Are you responsible for doing that yourself? Could you repeat your question one more time? <laughs> yeah, so um, you say, as an aside, when you call one number function from another one, there's a little overhead because sometimes the compiler can inline that dependent or that dependency into the dependent function. So if you were to redefine the function you've included into the other function, you would have to recompile the first function that depends on it. Well, um, it depends on is, are you talking about, is it, it's a couple of different things that's consider if it's like a kind of a direct dependency or if it's a if it's inline or whatnot. Um different yeah, something simple enough that it could be inlined into the parent function. Mm -hmm. But then so, you change. Uh, yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. So then if you were to change that child function and recompile it, does that somewhere in number trigger some kind of dependency to say next time you run the parent function? that has to be recompiled because I've detected that one of its dependents, it does that automatically. You don't have to do that yourself. It's gonna need to be, um, it will need to be recompiled to incorporate that new, um, the new version of that inner function. So but you have to do that yourself. The runtime does not take care of that um, on the next function call. No, it should happen automatically when the outer, oh, okay. outer function gets invoked, but it is, it's recompiled. Okay, awesome, thanks. Does, does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that's nice. Very nice. Okay, awesome. Any other questions? All right. So let's move on to our exercise here. And let me, I'll just reload a little bit. Just for one second. So now we have our exercise here using number. And so kind of take a look at our exercise that we have here. So we have, 
we're going to use number to compile just a, a simple function for the CPU. And so with this, it's just going to be the Monte Carlo um, method to determine pi. And we have the function itself um, is already working. So you can, you can, you can, what we're going to do is we want to work on completing the two to do's in order to compile the Monte Carlo pi with number before executing those three cells. And so this is a little hands-on interactive exercise for everyone to work on. And so with these to-dos, what you wanna do is include them as well. So let's kind of take a, about maybe five minutes to see, to allow people a little bit of time to work on this example. And to step through it. And then we will walk through everything ourselves as well. That's okay. I know I'm providing a little bit of a solution for it, but. Does anyone have any questions about the directives for this exercise to complete the two to-dos in your code? So we already have this function here available and implemented for us. So let's go through a little click happy. And so we have our, our number um, function here and it's going to compile a Monte Carlo. Yeah, I, I went ahead and um, I worked a little bit and I think my updates to the solution got included into the original code. So that's a little bit on my part. <laughs> And so what we have here is, but we'll let's allow people just about five minutes to kind of see and work through it. And then we'll step through and explain if that's okay. Okay, well, um, let's go ahead and kind of just step through our little um, example that we have here. And so what we do is we're going to start by setting our number of samples, and we have set it right up here to 1 million. And then we want to define um, those samples within our, within our Monte Carlo simulation, right? So here we import our random we import numbers um, just in time compiler function and we import random as well as from number we import just in time decorator. And so we're gonna use the number compiler in order to compile this function. And so with that, we have our declaration again for our decorator and then we have our Monte Carlo method. And so within our method, what we have going on is we're just iterating over our number of our samples, and it's going to generate random um, coordinates that we have. So for I in range of N samples, so up to 1 million, that's right, 1 million, yeah. 
Um, we are going to generate X coordinates, random X coordinates and random Y coordinates as well. Okay. And then we're going to have the, the ratio of the points inside of that um, to check for a unit circle, check that ratio inside of that and see how we can approximate pi. All right. And so next, after we have executed that, we have, we're gonna test things using uh, NumPy's testing library. And that's just gonna confirm that we have compiled and uncompiled versions that will run the same for us. And so in this aspect, what we have here is we use NumPy's testing library, and then we can verify that the alter, the, our optimization hasn't been able to alter our behavior as well. And so then we're also able to time our samples again and do some benchmarking and comparison as well. A little bit. Went through. Mm. Uh, right. Let me do a quick. I'm going to do a quick relaunch. Um, okay. So was everyone able to work through and? also do the timing and comparison between those two uh, implementations of the methods. Execute these again. So the, the time it, the Monte Carlo Pi runs in 8.16 milliseconds. The Monte Carlo Pi using the Pi, pi function runs in 202 milliseconds. Okay. Did anyone have any issues with that? Okay. So next let's move on to just kind of understanding a little bit of how number works. And so one thing that we want to do is make sure that we understand that um, what well, we've already seen number in action and seeing how it um, some of the performance benefits that it can have when we use it. All right, so there are different functions that we can use in, in order to understand it as well. So with this, we have our, within our do math function, it's going to, it's calling just the Python function. And then we have our function arguments again. And then what we have is our type inference occurring, bytecode analysis, and various other processes that occur before we are able to execute. Okay, and so here we have our hypotenuse function, and then we have a call for being able to do an inspect types call for our hypotenuse function. And so what that means is that, um, well, typically uh, one thing that we want to consider is that with uh, NumPy, type names such as float or we got float 64 and those are used for precision again. But within the process of being able to provide for standard Python functions, we apply our, our we apply our JIT decorator in order to be able to get that intermediary representation. But we also need to use our lower level representation of the code in order to use number in order to optimize specific functions. So it's different components that you have to take into consideration from the type inference to the rewrite to the lowering as well. So a couple of different uh, elements and components that we have to consider. So when we say that we're talking about the lowering, um, what that means is that uh, in essence, it's like number converts our rewritten IR into our LLDM IR. And so that's just going to be our 
low level uh, virtual machine code. And so that's just gonna be how the framework is able to compile and generate our new machine code correctly. And so once the, uh, the LLVM IR is passed into our just-in-time compiler, it gets converted into machine code and that can be used for our GPU targets to execute. And so with NVIDIA's, um, their LLVM base JIT compiler is able to generate our CUDA code for our uh, CUDA code for CUDA enabled GPUs. Okay. So why is it important to, why is type inference important? Does anyone have any thoughts on this and how it could affect code performance? All right, Sam, for the win. Most of Python's, much of Python's overhead is real-time typecasting and memory and striding. Different types have different number of bits. Koichi, amount of memory needed, data transfer. You want to elaborate a little bit more, Koichi? or Peter, or Carl? Anyone want to elaborate a little bit more on their the feedback that they've, or the input that they've given? Well, we all, well, what we want to definitely know is, oh, just random thoughts with coffee, no more elaboration. Okay, that's perfectly fine. So it's it's definitely important because the it allowed the compilation process can be used in order for us to be able to determine uh, correctly if the function is working right. So inferred types can allow for us to have more efficient machine code. And so, in HPC, the milliseconds and nanoseconds make a big difference. So we want to use um, different ways so that we can determine that we're using it most efficiently. So one way that we could do that is by using inspect types. And so with inspect types, we have a, a strong tool that we can use for being able to, to debug and optimize various number functions. And so, Number and number number is going to infer to different functions so that we can have things be as efficient as possible. Right. So here we can have a little breakdown for debugging and whatnot. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so let's continue on because we're, looks like we're creeping up to the end of our meeting time. And so what we wanna do is also continue on by focusing on understanding how number is used for GPUs and universal functions with UFOX. So we'll begin, you know, first by focusing on understanding how can number be used to compile NumPy universal functions or UFOX. So, one of the most important things that we want to make sure we keep in mind is that uh, with GPU program, GPU programming, we can get started with the GPU hardware and it's going to be designed for that parallelism. So we want to be able to make sure that we can maximize our throughput with our, with our GPUs and computing and get those same op operations on many different elements at once. Um, so with NumPy universal functions, what we have is the ability to perform those same operations on, on every element in the NumPy array. And that allows for us to just um, naturally be able to uh, 
process the data in parallel, so it's a, a natural fit for for using on G, for using GPUs. So let's have a little review of our NumPy universal functions. For those that are new to Python or Python newbies, uh, please click on this little NumPy quick start tutorial after this session if you would like to review a little bit more in detail. And so with this, let's, okay, so NumPy has a, a, a concept called uh, universal functions. And these are functions that can take uh, NumPy arrays um, and these can be arrays of varying, various dimensions, scalars, and they can operate it on them element by element. And so with that, we can use the NumPy add ufunc to demonstrate how a basic uh, ufunc me mechanism would work, okay? So here we have a couple of um, code samples and uh, a couple of um, code segments and um, function calls that are able to demonstrate this. So I'll give everyone about three minutes to just kind of look through and work and understand. And then we will talk through and work through these example, this example together. So let's take about two minutes for everyone to look through it and understand. And again, if you have questions, please make sure that you are entering them into our Q&A doc. We will um, follow, by, follow back up with any questions that aren't answered by the end of the call. And the Q&A document will remain open for, um, so as you work through the workbook or go through the slides, if you have other questions you want to refer back to. Let's get that about two more minutes, please. Okay. So who has worked with universal functions before, with NumPy's universal functions before? We have any one care to raise their hand if you've worked with it before? Okay, well, before moving on, we just want to make sure we have a Peter has. Okay, good. Jan, awesome. Bowen, okay, great, great. Okay, so well, before we go further within diving into you know understanding more advanced uh, components when it comes to GPU programming and GPU specific CUDA programming, we want to make sure we just everyone has a at least a good solid understanding of how UFUNCs can be used. Um, so if you're not familiar with them, click on that tutorial um, link afterwards so you can understand. But we just use these UFUNCs in order so we can operate element-wise on these arrays. And so they can handle arrays of different you know, dimensions and sizes so that we can use them. So let's just work through a simple um, example that we have here of using, uh, using them. So in this example, we have uh, UFUNCs that are working in a application, and we're going to use the add to add two arrays together element-wise. And so we have two arrays that um, have different values, arrays A and B. And what we're going to do is it's just a simple add function element-wise to, to sum those up together. And so it's going to return uh, the resultant of adding e every element in A to ele every element in B. So if we step through, and again, it's a quick summation of those. And so UFUNCs can also be used to combine scalars with arrays together as well. 
one. So in this instance, we're able to provide, to combine them together. And it's just basically adding 100 to ele every element in um, our in our um, add array, in, in our A array, and returning a new one. So arrays of different um, arrays of different but compatible dimensions can also be combined with the technique called broadcasting as well. And so in this continuing on. And so what we have here is we have our this is going to result in we have an array of 11, this is, it's going to get added. So going back up, one on one, then we come down with our broadcasting. And so we can use our UFUNCs on these different dimensions and as long as um, their shapes are compatible, we can have the, the lower dimension array um, broadcast uh, across and expand across the other arrays and the dimensions. So the smaller array um, is going to be, be going to match the much larger array in that aspect. So that's just a simple example. We have a 1D array and a 2D array, and we can add them together using broadcasting. And what NumPy does is it automatically expands it. Okay. Does that make sense? Or do we have any questions about it? So why would, um, thank you, Alfred. So why would, how could UFUNCs be used um, specifically to accelerate um, any computations that you might have in, in existing applications for for any large scale computations that you have. Well, if you if you have um, vectorized data in arrays, you're able to you're able to um, more efficiently uh, optimize that data and provide for a si more significant time savings um, using UFUNCs to make those resources more engaging. So uh, not make more engaging, but make them more um, efficient. Okay, so let's continue on. So how can we make UFUNCs for our GPUs? So what we do know is that Numba has the ability to create those compiled UFUNCs. And a lot of times it's not as easy out of the box as, um, as it would be if it was a, a C application or C code. But with Numba, you can implement a scalar function on it and it'll perform on all of those inputs and it'll decorate it with the, uh, the at vectorize and number will then broadcast, will figure out the broadcast rules that are needed for it. So if you're familiar with NumPy, um, which we will get into a little bit later or on our next call, NumPy is able, NumPy's vectorize is Numba's vectorize decorator. And it is, it operates in a kind of similar manner. So let's take a look at a example that we have here. We have a question from Bohan. Or it, Bohan, did you have a question? Oh, okay, no, no worries. All right, so let's kind of take a look. We have a little example here. And We'll just let people take a quick look at it before we're we're wrapping, we're coming up at the end. So let's have everyone take a look at it and then we'll work through this example. And this can be a, a point for us to pick back up at on our next um, CUDA Python community call. 
So I'll give everyone about one minute just to look through the, the code and step through it for a little bit. Okay, so what we have here, so let's start and just discuss some of the aspects of the little simple code segment that we hear. So we have from number, we're gonna input our vectorize. And what we have is our vectorize decorator is going to allow for us to convert that scalar function into a ufunc. And then that can be um, automatically and more efficiently executed on our GPUs. And so essentially our vectorized decorator is what we use to automate the process um, of paralyzing those many operations across different data points. And so here we have uh, a function definition for add 10. And it's gonna add 10 to a scalar operation to each element that's passed in. So then we also have NumPy we have our ability to, <clears throat> excuse me. So stepping through again, so we've added 10 to our, pass the whole array into our ufunc, and it performs the operation on each element. And so we have our new result here. Okay. And so we are, what this means is typically we're just generating a, a ufunc that uses CUDA on the GPU, and that allows for an addition of giving an explicit type signature. And so we can have settings for different settings for different target attributes that we can use. And those are different arguments that describe the types of uses that we can have in our uf ufuncs for both the arguments and the return value. And so specifying that we have our return value type and the type of the art and, and specifying the, the argument values. And so here we can step through for our different definitions. We're going to add our ufunc. Something went wrong. Oh, just a grid size underutilization. So just that. And so, so let's wrap up with a little bit of a little benchmarking on NumPy on our CPU versus the GPU. And so you want to keep in mind a few things that Numba does automatically. Um, it compiles a, a CUDA kernel to execute that ufunc operation in parallel over those input elements. Um, it allocates the GPU memory for the inputs and the outputs. And then we're able to copy that input data into the GPU. That data gets executed in the CUDA kernel via GPU function with the correct kernel dimensions given the input sizes. And then what we're able to do is copy the result back from the GPU to the CPU and return the result as a NumPy array on our host. So it's pretty concise when you compare it to a C implementation, but I don't think that takes much when you, you know, this is anything can be more concise than a C implementation. But um, so a little bit of benchmarking comparing NumPy on the CPU versus the GPU. So we have our time at np.add, and then we have it on the GPU as well. That might take a couple of minutes to run again. So our, on the CPU is in 1.21, but on our GPU in 6.26. So what we see here is that the GPU is a lot slower than the CPU. And so this is a little bit expected. Um, and essentially, it, it speaks to a, a dynamic that a lot of people have when they are trying to port their code from a CPU to a GPU in that it's not always the most optimal for a number of different reasons. And so we have a couple of different reasons to understand why it, the performance uh, degraded so much. Um, from the CPU to the GPU, um, such as the inputs are too small, calculations too simple, copying data to and from the GPU, and the data types are larger than necessary. 
So it's not always a one size uh, fits, fits all for us in this essence and copying from a CPU to our, or, or porting onto a GPU. Okay. And I think well, we have about two minutes to go. So I think this is a good time for us to stop and any last uh, lingering questions that anyone may have. And what we can do is we'll mark this as a, a stopping part and we'll pick back up uh, in a few weeks on our next announced uh, NUG community call for CUDA Python. But does anyone have any questions over the, the content that we've covered? Oh. oh, okay, yeah, okay. It won't, it probably won't be next week. We do have um, a hackathon going on. So, but likely the week after that, that we'll schedule another NUG community call. That's a very good question, Kevin. Kevin says he wonders how the new GPUs, how the case would perform on the new GPUs. But again, I think it's also a case that this just is too small of a um, of an example for the the inputs and the calculations that it's just not complex enough. But I wonder if it does make a difference. Maybe the maybe instead of it being six hundred and twenty six, is you know two hundred or three hundred. I guess it would depend on the architectural changes that they made to the way it's the GPUs are configured. Hi, Carl. There are a couple of different decorators that you can use. Um, we will introduce them as we go. But what we can do, if you want to enter your question into the Q&A doc, I can provide you with a list of um, the resources the, and additional function decorators that can be used as well. That's a good question, though. Okay, everyone. Well, it is the top of the hour now, so I will not um, keep you past. But uh, thank you so much for attending our community call today. Uh, please be on the lookout for um, our next series of calls. And also, please, uh, if you can, take, take a moment right now to uh, submit, our, submit your responses to our survey for today. Uh, that helps us to determine how we can improve our, um, how we can improve the trainings moving forward. Yes, Kevin, we are going to focus on Kupai on our next call.